Okay, a very good morning to you all. Uh, A very good morning to all our viewers and listeners uh, on the second day of April. It's a good Friday for uh, the believers. So um, it's one of those unique Fridays when I have to have uh, conduct this show amid uh, what is uh, widely known as a public holiday. But uh, either way, it's good to you all on set. Um, and for the next one hour, we're going to be discussing um, look, putting a spotlight uh, on our parliament, uh, they said did celebrate a hundred years. Um, but um, as Ugandans, what does that mean beyond celebrating? I think it's important to take stock of the kind of parliament, uh, how it has evolved over time, and uh, and uh, up to a point where we are now. I know the number of mixed reactions on on the performance of our parliament. So we will look at, um, are we on a progressive path, path or are we on a regressive path concerning how uh, our parliament is expanding its work uh, in, in trying to promote uh, democracy. With you again, as usual, my name is Felix uh, Kafuma. I'll be moderating this show for the next one hour. And also um, in the studios, I'm happy that I have two guests a gentleman and a lady, and uh, these are known faces. I'll start with a lady. Um, I have a political analyst. She's also a human rights activist for over 10 years. She's an ambassador for uh, sustainable development goals. And she's so passionate about, especially uh, the SDG 16, which talks about peace justice and building strong institutions. He's also a university lecturer for constitutionalism and political development, uh, as well as human rights and political science. She was very active um, in 2018, like, participating in the African Youth Summit on the SDGs in Accra, Ghana. And uh, that's where she was also voted the chairperson of the East African Youth Committee on SDGs. She's a mentor, and she has mentored over 1,000 young people and uh, um, men and women all over the world. She also um, has run a number of advocacy campaigns, one of them being My Voice campaign, which aimed at amplifying youth voices in electoral democracy in Uganda. She's also, uh, she has also run a, 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 a campaign on promoting active citizenship. So um, allow me to uh, introduce Namai and Golibia. You are most welcome to this show. Thank you so much, Felix and the viewers. I'm happy to be with you today. Great. And then my other guest is none other than uh, David Pulkol. I'm sure uh, that name is not new in your ears, and that face is not new to you. Pulkol is a founding member of African Leadership Institute. And we know very well that AFLI, for uh, a number of a couple of years running, it has been uh, publishing the performance of MPs. Uh, so I think we would have a discussion in that area as well. But uh, he has a lot of experience uh, as a public servant, as an academician, he's also a social researcher and uh, a development professional. He lectured at Macquarie University. He has also at some point been a member of parliament. And uh, I think you'll have to share with us your experience. He also served as a cabinet minister. Um, he has headed the, uh, the external security organization two times. He, at some point, also served as the deputy regional director for UNICEF. Um, he is also a specialist in applied research, legislative practice, police analysis, um, then democratic governance. It's good to have you on site. Uh, you are most welcome, David Polkol. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, let's get this started. We, I know, uh, Lydia, you were giving us the years much earlier. I think you said 1888 when we had the first parliament. If I'm I, I, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, but there are certain 
parliaments I'm also very interested in, especially when we got in, I think from around 60, 62. Um, 1962? Uh, yes, up to, yeah. up to date. Uh, I think we've had about 10 parliaments in mm. between. Um, um, the, uh, and I know the first time we see parliament uh, being under attack and its powers taken was, I think, in the 1966. Yeah, that was a that crisis. Right. Yes, mm. and since then, we've had, uh, uh, I think it's difficult to look, to point at which parliament has exercised its functions without due interference of the executive, what we call an independent legislation. So I'm going to ask, and I'm starting with you. Um, yes, they celebrated uh, 100 years, to, um, but wh what is the significance looking at, uh, looking at the performance in, in terms of executing the tripartite role of the legislation, representation, and oversight? Um, what, in, this, in a snapshot, what can we talk about the quality and nature of our parliament over time? Thank you so much, Felix. Good morning, our viewers and everybody who is following in on the show. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, like I said, my name is Lydia Namayengo. And so when we talk about significance of celebrating 100 years of parliament, probably you will be counting uh, celebrating parliament at that time. But I want to take you back a little bit to the history of the parliament that you know. Parliament in Uganda basically began in 1888 when we had the Imperial British East African Company that started administration in Uganda which was basically a, a minimum at, at a lower level of a parliament which was in charge of collecting taxes, administration of justice on behalf of the British Crown, and also in being sure that they promote peace, order, and then good governance of all Ugandans. That's the time when we went through the 1902 uh, up to the 1962 90, uh, Constitution of Uganda. When we follow through the constitutional history of Uganda, you will actually realize that Uganda had the, its first constitution, which was the order in council, 1902 order in council, that gave back to most of these things that actually existed. But as we keep kept on following up from 1902 to 1962 to 1966 and all the others, you mentioned about the 1966 that was actually a helm of the many issues that happened. And one of the key issues that happened at that time was the Kabaka crisis, which actually led to so many, so much bloom on what happened in parliament. And you realize that in 1962, when we had our first constitution, uh, our first parliament, which was a national assembly, uh, that actually ran up to 1966, where we had John, John Bowen Griffiths, who was basically the speaker of that parliament, to the time when we went to the second parliament of 1967 to 1971, where we had Narendra M. Patel. At some point, there was some kind of participation. There was some kind of representation. Before, in, initially, we had seven representatives who actually represent, composed of the parliament, which was the first parliament in 1888, the one I talked about. But as time went on, when the Legislative Council was set up in 1933, that's when we now went, out, went down to expand the parliament a bit to become uh, 17 members of parliament, then to have 28 members of parliament, then to have 14 Africans, because initially the Legislative Assembly actually was just consisting of the Europeans who were the members of parliament representing us as Ugandans, because we were under a British colony. So maybe one of the things that we want to mark as part of parliament is being able to move away from the becoming a British colony, which was directly represented by Europeans and Indians, to now being represented by Africans and fellow Ugandans who are coming from the various regions of government, from the various regions of this country. So I think that that is one of the, the things that would actually make us mark the 100 years of parliament. And it will be very key because currently no European represents a Ugandan. Currently, no Indian represents a Ugandan. Currently, all the constituents that we have in Uganda from the 146 districts are represented by Ugandans. So that is a very key thing for us to ensure that at least we may not be able to say that we're directly not under colonialism anymore. We may be under indirect colonialism, but at least directly we are being represented by people who are coming from Uganda. So why do we mark these years of parliament? we should be able to mark this as a parliament because at least parliament has been able to exist as an institution and still existing. Because when you check the 1995 constitution of Uganda, it basically brings about the establishment of chapter six, which is the legislature. And it says there shall be parliament of Uganda, which shall be able to have people who are coming from the different constituencies, the directly elected constituencies, the members of parliament representing the women, youth, and all the others. So one of the things that we would want to be able to look at is that we have been able to have a parliament which is existing, 
that has not yet been overthrown. We have been able to, to have a parliament that has upheld the constitution. It has not been able to overthrow the constitution. We have been able to have a parliament that has tried at least to, to be able to, pro, to pass some bills and laws and acts of parliament that are seeing this country being uh, like governed against. And we have been able to see a parliament that has been able to make and approve national budgets because we realize that the main key uh, functions of parliament is basically legislation, uh, representation, oversight, and appropriation. And I think that to some extent, to a lower extent, parliament has been able to make the laws. To some extent, parliament has been able to make national budgets every financial year. Even when we say that the national budgets have not been able to prioritize issues concerning the citizens, in most cases, they're always prioritizing either the military, or maybe they're either prioritizing either uh, the state house, they're always prioritizing either issues to do with security. They have not been able to come up to prioritize issues concerning the citizens, like health, like agriculture, which is the backbone of this economy, like education, and also skilling and employment. That is one issue, but at least every financial year, one of its functions, which is appropriation, through making a national budget, parliament has been able to make a national budget every financial year, it has been able to get representatives and hold elections in the name of representation every financial year, every five years. And we have been able to make laws every other now, every other time and then. And we have also been able to advance to actually uh, putting up national development plans that have the different things that we're going to be able to do as a country and we're going to be able to move through as a country. Okay. However, you realize that most of the issues that actually parliament is supposed to be doing are not being done. We are seeing a parliament today that is being controlled by the executive. We are seeing first, a parliament uh, today. Lydia, Lydia, first one yes. is there. We are going to come okay. to that point where now we look at what are some of the uh, the, 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 the gaps that parliament is okay. facing. Uh, okay. This is where I want to bring in uh, um, David. Um, David. David, I don't know. Uh, probably you are the you are older among all of us here. Um, I want to look at the period after. Uh, we got independence because I know the first parliament after independence was the 60 to 66, and then the next parliament which we had thereafter was the parliament of uh, 66 71, which you call the second parliament after we got independence. The third was 79 to 80, a very short lived parliament, uh, because at that point in time, um, uh, power kept changing hands. The fourth parliament was the one between 80 to 85, the fifth parliament. I don't know which parliament you served in. Was it the fifth or the sixth of uh, 86 to 96, which was uh, mainly the National Resistance Council, which served as a fifth parliament? The, uh, the sixth was between 96 to 2001, probably it's that one. Then the seventh parliament was between 2001 and 2006. Uh, then we've had the eighth parliament between 2006 and 2011. Um, the ninth parliament, 2011, 2016. Then uh, uh, we are also having the 10th parliament, which is running its term before we can enter into the 11th parliament. Looking at all those parliaments, um, which parliament can you quickly point to that you feel um, has performed better than any other? And why? Well, uh... It's, uh, it's difficult to say it with precision because then you don't have uh, the scoring of each of those parliaments for you to look at the trends and the patterns and see how uh, it has been increasing or decreasing. But uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the first parliament, it's, uh, it was a quasi-unitary uh, government a federal uh, system of government, quasi-political uh, multi-party, because uh, the rest of Uganda was uh, based on political party representation. And in the case of Uganda, it was the Lukiko to uh, nominate people or to elect people to come to the national level. So there was Kabaka Yaka and the, and the alliance of Kabaka Yaka and, and UPC uh, and so forth. So you can see Ugandans entered into independence uh, with the, the constitution of 1962 and therefore a parliament therefrom uh, that was, uh, as I said again, uh, quasi. Okay, you have unitary government existing, which used to be part of the crown the British crown, 
And then you had those areas that were part of the kingdoms or kingdoms of Busoga and so forth, and kingdoms of the, 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 the Toro, uh, to the, I mean, 1901 agreement or 1900 agreement in terms of Uganda, in terms of Angola agreement and so forth. So those kinds of uh, uh, quasi. So we entered into a formula uh, where we govern ourselves in a multi-party dispensation. And as we moved on, multi-party, quasi-unitary, and uh, quasi-federal, uh, and so forth. So as we went on, I looked into the rules of procedure for that parliament when we were designing the rules of procedure for another multi-party system when Uganda chose through a referendum to go back to, from a system to uh, a multi-party system uh, to derive this. So we had the opportunity to look back into those debates, the numbers, and so forth. Mm -hmm using their rules of procedure to inform the current rules of procedure for a multi-party parliament. Now, when you come down to uh, 66 crisis and therefore 1967 constitution, uh, an assault on constitutionalism to take away power and centralize it on the executive in terms of the presidency. Uh, so uh, the Pigeon Hall constitution, as it is uh, named, and uh, that followed from him, from it, uh, uh, which was still, again, one party dominance. And you see people crossing the floors. Mm. Okay, people elect you as a DP or as a, this party. And then when you reach the floor, without even seeking uh, approval of your constituents, you just cross the floor in terms of state capital again. So you see, or, uh, we began as a multi-party democracy. We ended up as a single party democracy. And then came the Idi Amin era. Amin had no pretense, okay? He ruled with bare knuckle. Mm. Uh, you can say if you are man enough, why don't you do like Idi Amin did? <laughs> Idi Amin just, uh, what did he do? He abrogated the constitution, he suspended the constitution, he dissolved parliament and ruled by decree. Mm. The, the word of the president became the law and could be drafted into a, a legal thing. Like he dreamt in Moroto, he saw Asians running away. He saw Africans prospering. And when he reached uh, Tororo the following morning, he made a decree ordering Indians to flee, to run away, and in 90 days. So just out of a dream, imagine in uh, <laughs> the Mabo city now of Moroto. Uh, and then he announcing this in air and sea bond raiment. Imagine, that's how he called the military barracks in Rubong in, in Tororo. It was air and seaborne regiment. Can you imagine Uganda having a, a seaborne uh, <laughs> army without a sea? But anyway, that is the fun. So we've gone into from a multi-party quasi-federal system of government to single party to now completely military dictatorship and authoritarianism. And then again, we bounce in, 20, uh, in, in, in 1980 into umbrella politics a no party system or UNLF, brief as it was with Rugumayo as its speaker, Monya Joke and uh, others, and of course Museveni in the military commission and Mwanga, and to now the elections again, multi-party system. Then back to uh, 1986, 85. Then we're back into the umbrella politics that we all be in one umbrella, big crowd, I don't know whether they are cows, uh, uh, in it or no cows. But that's the movement system. Again, now from there to a multi-party system. But what kind of multi-party democracy are we in now? So people have invented, with Ugandans have invented a system of democracy where you are in a multi-party mode of democracy when actually you are in a single party dictatorship so in terms of manufactured majorities in parliament manufactured as i've said again uh, uh so although we're not, we are supposed we are in a multi party but what kind of multi party are we running it's a single party or you are in a single party dictatorship but baptized as multi-party democracy so where you have a constitution and there's no constitutionalism between the electoral circles so what amount of constitutionalism how the constitution being upheld protected or even implemented between this, the electoral circle in the five years. So even during the electoral circle, you need election observers or we need now peacekeepers, okay? Uh, these are all issues 
uh, that uh, the amount of violence that is generated and therefore elections becoming just for uh, getting stamp of approval, okay, and, uh, and uh, with our imperfect uh, uh, democracy. So what then comes in is uh, what's the result of that parliament? If you allow, uh, I could just give you a few glimpses from our uh, performance scorecard, uh, what we found in terms of the four roles of parliament. Uh, or, or, uh, if you don't mind, can I just give you okay. a few? Please. Yeah. And uh, or in terms of the composition of the 10th parliament, that's where we are now. Mm. So 65.1% are males and 34.9% are female. So you can see the disparities in terms of representation, male and female. It's a male-dominated house, Hello. okay? Mm. And, uh, and uh, when you look at the positions of, uh, of leadership positions in parliament, you find women take 33.5%. What are these positions as vice president, speaker, deputy speaker, attorney general, deputy attorney general, government chief whip, cabinet ministers, leaders of opposition, opposition chief whips, deputy opposition chief whip, shadow ministers, chairpersons and vice chairpersons of committees and commissioners of parliament. When you look at who holds the leadership in our parliament today as an institution, 33.5% are women, of course, you can say that the Constitution or the 95 Constitutions puts 30 percent as a good thing. But I think should we, should the 100 year old institution still be looking like this? At 100, you already have property, you have grandchildren, you have. Uh, but do, is our parliament behaving like an adolescent or is it still behaving like an adolescent? Uh, these are all questions we need to look at. Now, when you look at representation, if you don't mind, I can continue. So 66.9% was, uh, uh, in terms of attendance, again, a very low attendance of the plenary. So you find that attendance of plenary uh, with 20% from Northern Uganda, 16% of Central Region. Can you imagine people attending plenary from Central Region, only 16%, where do they go? The rest go. 20% from Northern Uganda. These MPs who come from Eastern Uganda, 21%. 18% from Western Uganda who attend plenary. And then you find committee attendance is much better. Again, Northern MPs attend 42% of committees. Central Uganda attends 43% of the MPs attend committees. Eastern Uganda, 49% of the MPs attend committees. Western Uganda, 40% of their members attend committees. Where do the rest go? None of this is 50%. So why then do we have such a big house of people who don't attend plenary? And they also, also don't attend don't committees. Mm. And now, uh, and then we found that women outperform males in attendance of plenary, and men outperform women in attendance of committees. So imagine committees is where the business of parliament is done. Seventy percent of work of parliament is done through committees, but then the decisions are taken the plenary. All the committee reports are brought to the plenary. That's where the women. And women um, uh, attend more where decisions are being taken. And yet they don't attend at the cookhouse, uh, at the committees. And you find men attend committees more, but don't attend more. So, so you can see uh, the low attendance indicates ineffective institutional system of our, that's the state of our parliament, very ineffective. It has no system to compel MPs to prioritize the schedules and rules of procedure of the business. Because if you cannot compel MPs to attend committees, tell them to attend plenary, then what is the state of our parliament? We are saying it is ineffective. Then parliamentary performance scorecard, for us, we did not get any witness, uh, any systematic retribution or punishment procedure for members skipping parliamentary business. So people can go on study leave, people can absent themselves and show up on 15th day and absent again. And then there are sacred cows who never turn at all, and nothing is done to them. So, so this is our parliament on, uh, on representation. When you go to legislation, we found only 51.4% of our MPs actually participated in debating and enacting laws. When we look at how many laws were passed, which MPs took on the floor, which number of MPs moved amendments to those laws, you find only 514 are the ones participating in making laws. 
So where do the rest go? And then you find, again, 18.5% of all the bills, okay, comply with the rule of procedure and that one, a, rule, a, a bill must stay in a committee for a maximum of 45 days so that business does not remain in the committee. But now we found only 18.5% comply with that rule. And we found most of those bills that comply with the 40 days rule are those which deal with, with resources, taxation, custom duty, what adjusting, where money, you know, taxation things are, the economy. The rest are staying longer. Like for example, domestic relations bill, it's taken over 1,000, I think, 300 days. It has not come back from the committee since it was taken to a committee. You, 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 there, there, there are committees that, that there are bills that have spent 900 days. How many years are those that a committee is stuck with business and has not brought back to plenary? Implying that time is not effectively used by committees to avoid backlogs. So there's a lot of backlog. You may find that PAC, for example, is considering uh, Auditor General's report of three years back. Mm. Those parliaments have ended, and now their reports, how do you act on them? It's stale, you know? So because of backlog, again, additionally, bills were found not to be given equal attention as committees prioritize bills. Like you saw how OTT bill was expedited within a short time. Now you find data protection privacy bill has taken over 900 days. You find domestic relations bill are also taking over 1,153 days and still counting. It has not yet come back. So there was no evidence to, to compel MPs to equally prioritize the bills uh, and to conduct uh, even research to equip the house with adequate knowledge to equip members to address difficult bills. So this is this is the state of our parliament. When you go to oversight, uh, you find again that. 36% of the issues of national concern that citizens raised are from Western Uganda. 27% of issues raised are from Central Uganda. 27% from Northern Uganda. 11% from Eastern Uganda. So the underperformance of Eastern region MPs in this area is not explained. But you can see again, you're talking about 36%, 27%, 27%, 11%. So nobody is making the 50%. So what really is happening? Further, you can see the national issues raised covered only eight sectors, 29% on local government, 21% on human development, education, health, and so forth, 14% on agriculture, trade and investment, 13%. The issues which MPs raise on the floor, 7% on environment, 6% on infrastructure, 6% on social issues. Now, when you look at 3% on foreign affairs, again, in our parliament today, the, the ministers responded to 51% of these issues raised instantly. Okay? But there's no evidence obtained to practical, systematic procedure for ministers to provide response. In the Zambian parliament, for example, ministers are given 60 days in which to report back to parliament on a matter that parliament has decided. In our case here, no, no requirement. You can go on holiday. You, nobody will come back to you to say, you said this last time, how far have you gone? Nothing in our parliament today. Members of parliament were largely absent in district local council meetings. Our local government act makes members of parliament ex-official member of their district councils. Because MPs come with a lot of information from the centre, they meet the president, they meet the ministers, they have taken decisions. The councillors come from the sub-counties with the concerns and problems of people. So when they meet in the district council, the idea was that cross-fertilization takes place. The MPs leave a lot of information for councillors to take that information to the grassroots, and then they pick from the councillors issues to bring to the national level during their question time, to raise petitions, to, you know, for, to inform their debates. Now, if MPs don't attend district council meeting, so you find that our democracy is not functioning the way it was supposed to. Now, when you come to appropriation, that means uh, uh, allocating budgets. You may find that 60% of the budgets complied with the provisions of, uh, of the law, i.e., for example, a department of government must align its budget to the national plan, three, national plan two. Now, if only 60% of the ministries, departments, 
governments, agencies of government, only 60% have aligned their budgets to the national plan. So they are violating the Finance Act. Okay? So then what happens to the 40% which do not comply? Those ministries that have not aligned their strategic plans to the national plan. So which plan are we budgeting for? So will this plan of taking Uganda 2040, will it be implemented? Because if only 60% is budgeted for, so if what happens to the other budget? That's the state of our budget of our parliament today. When you go to the way they procure loans, you can see now we are reaching 50% of our GDP in loans. And how much money is going to, to servicing the debts? So is our parliament using their power of appropriation? Well, if you look at the current debt, you may be saying per, per population, you may say every Uganda now has got 1.2 million shillings. If you are carrying a debt of 1.2 million. David, David I, must, I, must, I right? want to jump in there. I want to jump in there. Thank you. Um, because uh, we had a discussion around uh, the debt the debt burden of Uganda. But uh, I'm going to come back to you to elaborate some of those things. Um, but when, I want us to go for a break. But when I come back for, uh, from, from the break, um, I'm going to bring in here Lydia because you've raised a number of things. And that's why I left you to flow and interrupted because I want Lydia to, you've raised things concerning um, the leadership issues, things concerning leg legislation, um, the gaps, concerning representation with some interesting statistics and, and also some bit of uh, gaps concerning appropriation. And uh, when Lydia, we, uh, uh, we come back and we are going to kind of like ask ourselves a golden question. Because what David is sharing with us is the performance of the 10th parliament. But there have been arguments that over time, the quality of parliament has been reducing. Um, um, some people have argued that probably the best parliaments we had were the seventh and eighth. Um, and, and depending on, I think, what they saw come out of those parliaments, compared to um, some parliaments like the tenth and the ninth, and some are saying that probably even the eleventh parliament might be worse. So I want you to, when we come back, to discuss why are we having a parliament that is on a down low? Let's go for a short break. The master of money politics is eating up Uganda's democracy. When you take money from a candidate, it means you are feeding the monster. Then you become a part of the problem. When a candidate who overspends on campaigns is elected, he or she will not represent voters but himself. He or she will engage in corruption to recover campaign money. Social services will not be delivered and the voter will suffer more. Voter, let's be wise. Give democracy a chance. Do not sell your vote. Focus on the issue. Okay, you are welcome. Most welcome back to uh, our second part of Action Talks. Uh, we are busy discussing, looking at the 100 years of parliament. Um, are we having a progression or regression? Before we went for a break, uh, uh, David was painting a picture that is answering the part of regression. Um, and uh, he gave us some interesting statistics concerning how, how parliament is performing in terms of appropriation, in terms of representation, in terms of legislation. Um, painting a picture of worth worrying about, but Lydia, um, the people who have argued about the sixth parliament it was one of those parliaments that exercised some level of independence. I think because of the, uh, some, I think it was it's remembered for having, <laughs> having tackled, for example, government corruption. So people are arguing that probably it was strong in that area. Um, then others have argued that probably also the seventh parliament, um, um, although albeit 
it is uh, much tainted with a five million bribe. I think you remember that bribe of, of removal. I think it was for removal of uh, term limits. Term, yes, term um, limits, term yeah. limits um, uh, makes it much less um, a palatable parliament to some people. But at some edges, probably it still had some grit. There were some good legislators in that parliament who could uh, debate very well, eloquently, and and pass bills. Why, cons considering what David has shared, why are we having a parliament that one I would say keeps diluting? every cycle. Okay, thank you so much. Our parliament keeps diluting every cycle and the quality of parliament keeps going down every cycle because of many issues. But first of the, some of those issues basically rotate around the electoral cycle, right from the pre-electoral period to the election day and then after the elections. But before the elections, one of the key issues is that what kind of leaders do we elect in the elections when we go out to elect? Today, citizens have resorted to commercialization of politics. A person who has money to bribe voters is the person that they're going to be able to vote into parliament. Now, this has become a very big problem because we have now resorted to having businessmen becoming political leaders and taking over governance of this country rather than the people who are supposed to be able to govern this country. So when you have people who actually go ahead to come and stand in parliament as leaders, who have not been able to go through any kind of training, who have no background in leadership whatsoever, who have no background on, or, or maybe qualifications in leadership, who have no interest in leadership but have just come to parliament to make money, then we will not be able to expect a qualitative debate, debate from such kinds of leaders. So I think that one of the things comes from the voters that time when we go to vote, we are not voting for people who have quality, people who can debate issues, people who can speak about issues concerning us, who understand what leadership is about, but we are voting for people who have been able to buy us and pay us money to be able to actually go ahead and uh, ensure that we can get into that, that, that the space. And then number two, the quality has also been able to reduce because of the leaders who are not accountable. When political leaders who have been able to be voted into power fail to become accountable, fail to give accountability in terms of delivering services as promised, then we actually realize that the kind the type of leaders you're going to be able to get are going to be very terrible. Then the other thing you could be able to think about is that in most cases, we had been able to lack qualitative and continuous voter education regarding to the roles and responsibilities of different leaders. Citizens are voting leaders into positions, not because they are the right leaders, but because they don't understand what a member of parliament should do. People go to parliament and they'll promise to make roads. People go to parliament and they'll promise to construct schools. They'll promise to give them uh, bursaries. They will go and attend every barrier every now and then. So they are going to be voted into power, not because they are the right leaders who understand leadership and are going to be able to vote qualitatively, but because they are the people who have been able to provide finances and all the other things to the citizens. Then the other thing you actually had not been able to go ahead to run away from is the continuous interference in the powers of parliament, in the independence, because we have seen today there has been continuous lack of separation of powers among the three arms of government. Every day in this kind of government we're living in, because we are under a unitary system of government where we have one central uh, authority that is in charge of power, as, as, aside from the federal system of government where we have power coming from both the central and then also the regional states, today under a unitary system of government where we have three organs of government, we have seen the executive overthrow the two other organs of government, the parliament and judiciary, and become the only organ performing. To be particular, we have seen the office of the president overthrow the powers of parliament, the powers of the judiciary, the powers of the, of, 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 of the executive, and all the other kinds of things. Parliament today will debate on bills that do not concern citizens, but concern the government to stay in power, and they will pass them because of the interference of the executive. We have seen today parliament failing to be able to debate on issues because of continuous bribery and corruption that is happening in parliament. Today, leaders will be taken to Changkwan's Leadership Institute to bribe them, intimidate them, threaten them, even when they have failed to pass a national budget yesterday that was considered prioritizing issues concerning the people like health and education and agriculture, they will come back and still pass the same national budget the following month or the following week after being infiltrated by the executive through going through the Changkwan's Leadership Institute and after threatening them or promising them a kind of money. We have seen cases where the head of state has personally come and sit in parliament to ensure that what his interest is or wants is protected. 
For instance, in the 2017 amendment of the constitution, where we had to move the age limit, we saw when parliament was actually infiltrated, we saw the president coming into parliament to sit and observe who is voting no to move the age limit and who is voting yes to get to be able to get value for his money. We have seen military intervention come into parliament. Military has been able to actually intervene in parliamentary affairs where members of parliament have been beaten down, members of parliament have been hunted, members of parliament have been threatened and intimidated. So we find that at some point, this instills fear among the members of parliament. Why do we have a reducing qualitative debate? It is a whole lot of very many processes, but also we cannot be able to run away from the constitutional crisis. Uganda currently has a constitutional crisis where we find that most of the powers of appointment were given to the president, the sitting president of Uganda. The president has the powers to appoint the speaker, or has the powers to appoint the judiciary, has the powers to appoint the, the, Supreme, the, courts, the, judges, the, the judges of the Supreme Court, the judges of constitutional court, the judges of the courts of appeal, he appoints education service commission, the youth service commission, all these kinds of things. Even when, they have to come by to parliament. Parliament, even when they have to come to parliament for voting, we have a problem of the caucus, well, they vote depending on numbers. And in most cases, NRM has the majority numbers because what government has done today is that they have been able to divide up parishes to become constituencies. In Uganda today, some counties have become districts. Leaving alone the continuous issues that are actually like Article 179 talks about the issues that will be able to consider before creating a district or a constituency in terms of economic viability, in terms of the density of the population, in terms of the geographical features, but all these kinds of issues really they're done by the, the constitution are not actually being followed. So we will come to the parliament where we have a voting committee, but the voting committee, and this we have a parliament that is full of members of parliament who are also coming from the NRM, who are actually going to go and first consult with the NRM caucus system and then come up to the position. So in most cases, we're seeing a parliament which is actually controlled by the executive. We're seeing a parliament which is under arrest. We're seeing a parliament which is under prison. When parliament is under prison, even when you have 50 members of parliament, even when you have 30 or 20 members of parliament from the opposition, who would want to debate against a given issue? They are not going to be able to consider the quality of the debate. They're not going to be able to consider the issues that you're raising in the kind of the bills you're going to pass, but they're going to consider how many are voting yes and how many are voting no, which is going to be a very difficult problem. So I think that we need to be able to think through all these kinds of things. We need to be able to ensure that we can review our constitution and be able to make some amendments to this on the powers of the president, because initially having control over most of the institutions of, 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 of government wouldn't have been a problem. If you have a president that is going to serve five years or 10 years and go, under two terms, a president cannot be able to capture institutions of government. You cannot be able to capture parliament, you can't be able to capture the Bank of Uganda, you can't be able to capture the judiciary in just five years. But because we were able to amend this constitution forcefully in 2005 and then removed the term limits, and then we were able to again wrote the constitution and amend it forcefully in 2017 and remove the age limit and endorse life presidency. Today it has become a big problem that even when a presidential election petition is raised and taken to the judiciary, you will still find the same NRM cadres controlling the judiciary and they will still be able to go and work ahead and it serves the interests of the president who is existing executive and chief of arm. So okay. that becomes a very difficult issue today. Okay. Um... The, the issue is you're raising a number of issues that are that are contributing to the declining quality of parliament uh, that we are having. Um, you seem to point to to paint a picture that multi party our movement into the quote unquote multi party politics seemed to have worked against the quality of parliament because caucusing. There's nothing wrong with caucusing. Um, every party should have a position on every matter. And, 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 and probably the issue is on issues of national importance. At what point do you draw lines and, and, and do not necessarily pursue a party line which is not necessarily promoting all in recognizing that this is an issue of national importance? But that brings me to a question that I want to throw to, to uh, David. To what extent, um, when, when we talk about the independence of parliament, and, and partly Lydia has touched the elements concerning the independence of parliament as an institution. And, I, and I, in fact, I had a question here of whether parliament gave out its powers or the powers of independence were, were taken from it, or it 
voluntarily gave it away because um if if parliament chose to act independent it can in without due respect but to what extent is multi party politics the way we are practicing it affecting the quality of parliament <laughs> if uh, you put three questions in one <clears throat> yes. Uh, one is uh, its independence, the second is the quality, <laughs> and third is uh, uh, how, uh, what really happened, uh, okay, in terms of, in both of these two, in terms of independence, uh, in terms of quality. But let me start with independence. Yes, when we were at the CA, the Constituent Assembly, trying to craft a new constitution for the Republic of Uganda, and the Odoki Commission moved the country and moved and got amendment, got, got uh, suggestions and so forth, put a draft together. Then 93, 94, 95, we passed it. Okay, people had to be elected, one man, one vote. Previously, it was uh, through lining up and electoral colleges. And then to debate the constitution, we thought when we have directly elected people on based on one vote, <laughs> one man, one vote, to come and discuss the constitution. So what did we do? We tried to took away power from the executive, which was so powerful, and put that power to the institution of parliament, because the institution of parliament, for example, is the one which creates districts or creates uh, uh, geographic areas which have the capacity to become constituencies for electoral constituency purposes. It is only parliament. Right. The way today parliament is behaving, okay, because the procedure is the uh, Local council resolutions come to the Minister of Local Government that we intend to. Okay, the Minister of Local Government sends a committee, a commission, to investigate those issues that Lydia pointed out in terms of the economic viability, in terms of population, in terms of many things. Okay, and then writes a paper. Then the Minister of Local Government is supposed to write a cabinet paper. It goes to cabinet and then cabinet debates but it cannot create a district, it cannot create a constituency. It has to come to people's house and parliament. And then parliament is the one which debates and then approves. But what do you have today? You have MPs who go to plead with the president. You have a community which even goes to eat in front of the president to persuade him to- To give them a district. You have a case in parliament where an MP comes and wants to commit suicide using his own tie on the floor of parliament, unless Tororo is given a constituency. <laughs> so you, and now the very parliament is under the constitution, is the one with the power. Now then there's this emperor uh, moving around, masquerading as having power to issue people districts and so forth. Oh, it doesn't have in the constitution. So why did parliament give away its power? I'm just using that one single key to illustrate my point, that are there powers that the parliament has ceded back to the presidency, which we had removed on and brought to parliament. Now, when parliament gives a huge budget for envelopes, brown envelopes and so forth, gifts to the president. So you've created now uh, a kind of Republican monarch who goes around with the, your own, but if parliament does not vote that money, so where will he get to bribe anybody? You, you understand? Mm, mm. Parliament, which the executive brings the, I said, this COVID response. And then he said, with optimistically transactional, that uh, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Mm, and mm. that which legislate for its own interest. And now COVID response, the, the cabinet brings a, a, a bill, this uh, budget. And then you say, include us also inside. Otherwise, we shall not pass. If you don't give us also COVID money for responding as MPs, sorry. So they hold the executive at ransom. And then they also end up putting themselves into that. So in terms of, uh, so, it's also, now when you begin to legislate based on self-interest and uh, when you become transactional, at every slight provocation of the speaker, oh, I am the one uh, who removed time limits, who removed the head limit. If I did not remove, uh, then you know, <laughs> be in Raptura. You know, that did you do this so that you can, uh, you know, be compensated. you can see the kind of transactional politics. So where did, where did the independence? Because we gave parliament 
to be the only institution to determine its own emoluments, its own allowances, its own salaries, so that nobody can influence it. That was our idea. We were thinking that parliament would become independent because they don't have to beg to anybody to approve their salaries. They are the only institution in the land who can determine, can determine their, their salary. Mm, but has mm, mm. it worked? No. Instead, <laughs> that's not enough. It is still prone to, maybe we are wrong. So then you ask yourself, we took power that parliament can actually, as power, to sense a minister to recommend interdiction of a civil servant and removal from office. Parliament can impeach a president. No other institution in the land can remove a president by impeachment. So, but as parliament exercise this power, does it even know that they have this power? That if a minister refuses to behave in a way that you, uh, to the population of the people of Uganda, you can lock him out of, of parliament until he does something like this. So there are a few cases, by the way, that parliament exercised. Like, for example, I remember when Jacob Olanya was chairing in the third, in the third session, and then the, the committee, the, 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 the policy statements brought by ministers were substandard. So they were thrown back to Moses Ali, and the, uh, the parliament had joined. You ministers are not taking this parliament seriously. Go and revise this policy statement. They are just substandard. There was a time when there were no ministers, only one minister was in parliament, and the parliament had to close and send the prime minister to go and collect the other ministers who will respond to the issues we are raising. There are cases where parliament asserted itself, its independence. For example, when they want to pay uh, Uganda traders who were cheated in South Sudan or not paid in South Sudan, the executive came with a small list of the favored few. But parliament expanded that list, uh, you know, to bring other citizen people, uh, traders who are not. So there are cases where parliament has really acted to the best interest of citizens. For example, where people, where people register Uganda Airlines in their own personal names, and then want the government to put money. So you saw how the minority report by this woman MP from Lira, uh, Joyce Angom, uh, mm -hmm. okay, uh, brought the issue and it carried the day. So by the way, when we bash parliament, we should also look at some of these positives where yeah. parliament has tried to assert its independence. And the following day, what did you see? A, a proper registered Uganda Airlines, okay? Uh, uh, and so forth. So there are cases where they have saved a situation where they even made noise, even if they passed the OTT bill at 5%, mm -hmm. but they came back after that noise in civil society and so forth and reduced to 1%. So there are cases where our parliament has tried to assert its independence, but there are cases where they have ceded that's why somebody asked me in Moroto, how many parliaments does Uganda have? Because the one sitting in Kampala, chaired by Kadaga, removed taxes on paraffin, on salt, on what? But the one sitting in Entebbe put the taxes back, okay? And then the one sitting in Changwazi, so which parliament did we send our MPs to? Uh, these are the questions. The one where presented by Kadaga, or the one sitting in State House, or the one sitting in Chankwansi. In Chankwansi, our democracy is made to stand with his head upside down and the legs up. Why? The people's representatives who are supervisors of the executive, nyamparas of the executive, they oversee the executive and make sure the executive behaves to the best interest of citizens, make sure that the laws passed are implemented the way they were passed, make sure that the budget passed must be... Now, when you take people's representatives to Chankwansi, put them in green uniform. And then they find the executive comes with their pips on, okay? MPs don't have pips. The MPs are the ones saluting the executive. The ministers come with their pips. So you imagine a Nyampara, a supervisor, saluting his <laughs> <a> IC. <laughs> you know, it puts our democracy. <laughs> who should salute who? Who is the boss of who? So these are simple things, but it, it is telling you uh, how people are circumventing, how they're eroding the independence of parliament. Now look at this debate which is going on, on the speakership of parliament and deputy speakership of parliament. Now, I've just told you areas where the regulations are not being enforced, where uh, transactional politics is at its best, where money has taken over because people uh, have been voted because of their money, they have bought their vote, 
So they are no longer accountable to citizens because you are not the ones who elected me. I bought myself into power. And therefore, I have no responsibility to you. The role of money in politics, which is active, okay, uh, main area of concern, mm -hmm. is eroding that independence of parliament. Because now you find this woman MP, okay, being now next to these men who have a lot of money, okay, who will bring me back to parliament. Towards the last two years or three years of parliament, you find that, that they become so humble. And if you don't behave, the one who funded you the other time is used to, you know, uh, they will gang around against you and, and throw you out. So the role of money, again, and those money magnets, uh, and therefore whose interests are they? So how can citizens be empowered so that the MPs can become independent again? So that this Bad institution job. can become independent again. So when you look Bad at the quality job. of debate, because then you don't mind whether you attend or you don't attend. After all, your emoluments, your allowances are consolidated. Whether you attend or not, it is flowing to your bank. I wish we could separate it so that if you don't attend the house, you don't get allowance for that. Okay? If you don't debate, if you don't participate, we need to disaggregate your basic salary from these other emoluments and then make, oh, sorry. Let's come to yeah. that because you're you you you're moving into my next question and I'm going to start with, uh, which is okay because you've kind of like ushered me into that area. And I'm going to start with Lydia because uh, I was looking here, if my mathematics is correct, the previous parliament had 400, and the outgoing parliament, which is the 10th, had 457 MPs. And I think we are having 72 more. So our numbers are going to be somewhere around 529. I was listening to uh, um, to Honorable this gentleman of FDC, uh, Sam Junganda, saying that we, when you look at the bloated parliament, we are going to be spending one billion per day on on running that parliament. We've had disappointments with the tenth parliament. We've had disappointments with the ninth parliament. Looks like every parliament that comes is disappointing Ugandans. The expectations are high, but we end up being disappointed. What does, if, if you were to give, if, if you were to give the eleventh parliament a blank slate, what would be some of those things you would want them to, 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 what could ideally change about the eleventh parliament that can show we are back on the trajectory of having an independent, functional, strong a people parliament? Me? Yes, Lydia. Okay. Uh, so th thank you so much. For me, I would, if we are supposed to be able to go back to the strong people's parliament, I would want the 11th parliament to think about the first thing is prioritizing citizens' issues in the national budget making process. I think that if parliament can be able to prioritize issues, because we, like we said before, in many cases, the national budget has to become, has to actually work hand in hand with the National Development Plan. Are, Uganda is currently running the National Development Plan 3 that is actually running for five years. But in most cases, when we come up to make a budget of every financial year, like how we have the first one in September this year, in most cases, what in June, in June this year, or June, July this year, in most cases, what will happen is that you will see many things which are irrelevant to citizens taking the highest portion of the national budget. You will see state house taking the highest amount of money. You will see security. You will see UPDF taking the highest amount of money. Security yes. is important. It is very important. Yes, we admit that it's important. But it's not more important than education, than health, than a, a job creation, than employment, than skilling. Those are the basic issues to the, this country. If you have citizens who have jobs and have money to sustain themselves, you wouldn't want to have a big, a big team of security. For example, what is the use of SFC in this country? For instance, what is the use of having so many military officers in this country? What is the use of having so many police officers in this country? As long as you're able to tackle economic security, as long as you're able to have economic freedom in this country, then you don't have the military and the police having to take up a lot of money for, our, for, our, for us as a country. So I think that prioritizing citizens-driven issues in the national budget-making process by members of parliament would be one of the things that I want to see them stand up and if it refuses, and if the executive refuses to actually pass up that one, I will see members of parliament work in unity and say we are not going to pass this budget, whether the president wants it or not, 
and they will still stand their ground and say we are not passing this national budget. I want to see that happen in the coming parliament. Then I also want to see this budget bring about financial sobriety, financial sobriety in terms of fighting against corruption, because we have had members of parliament who have been able to have poverty of the mind. A member of parliament who was who's taking 30 million shillings as a salary, why would you take a, 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 20, a, a 5 million corruption bill uh, from the president? Why would you take 2 million from the president for you to pass a given law as a, as a bribe, yet you're actually earning 30 million shillings? That means that you're not just poor, but you actually have poverty of the mind. You never get satisfied with what you have. You are always thinking about getting more money, probably because you want to put the bills of the money that you have been able to put into the selection. So I would want to see members of parliament resisting bribes, corruption scandals from the executive and any other organ of government that is trying to bribe them to pass a bad law into parliament to becoming a law. That would actually be able to work out for me very well. I would also want to see members of parliament be able to defend their independence, be able to defend this constitution, be able to defend the, the supremacy of the constitution that is actually going to take it to take place. As long as we're not having a parliament that is following procedures, that is following constitutionalism, that is following and willing to protect the rule of law, we are not be, going to be able to go anywhere in our political development, in our democracy journey as a country. I would also want to see the parliament, this means military from parliament, I would want to see them take a stand to actually chase away parliament, military from parliament. For instance, I would also want to see them pass a law or an amendment to remove the minority groups, members of parliament from parliament. Why do we need to have youth MPs who cannot even represent youth from their region? Why do we need to have army MPs in parliament? Why do we need to have people with disability MPs? Why do we need to have workers MPs? Why do we need to have elderly MPs? Yet all of these categories of people have constituencies where they come from. They, all of these who have villages and districts where they come from, who already have women MPs for the district, and they have constituency MPs for the district. So I want to see them pass up an amendment to reduce on the size of parliament to ensure that we do not actually go ahead and have all these members of parliament to, who are not actually have, have, have passing the role to the members of parliament. I would also see them fight against public expenditure and loans and public debt. The public debt, like David said initially, is worrying in this country. I would want to see parliament be able to take a stand and say no more loans, especially to the loans that are going to service set house supplementary expenditures. Supplementary budgets coming from set house are sickening this country. Every financial year, every three months, after three months of passing the national budget, you always receive a supplementary budget for state house Used for what? Keeping Museveni in power. Used for what? Bribing people in opposition. Used for what? Buying tear gas and police and military and the army to be able to threaten citizens, not to demand for their rights. So if we can be able to have members of parliament who are going to reject unwanted loans and debts for this country, if a law is going to be able to be got to ensure that we are constructing a road, that is okay. If a loan is going to be got to consider uh, we're going to put up a standard budget away, that is okay. But a loan to service supplementary budgets for parliament, for, for executive and set house, a loan to bring more tear gas in this country, a loan to facilitate police in this country and military, I do not think this country needs such kinds of loans and public budgets to continue consuming us as a country and tripling us down as a country. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. And I'm coming to you last, David, uh, because our time is, I've, I'm three minutes into the top of the hour. Um, quickly, as we wrap up, what are your expectations of the 11th parliament? I, I can't hear you, uh, David, maybe your mic is muted. Yes, sorry. Okay. I, was, I was saying that uh, maybe they need to amend their rules of procedure so that systematically compel MPs to work within the prescribed period of disposing bills. We would like okay. to see okay. you, them become uh, uh, actually overcome those backlogs. Uh, secondly, I would like to, to improve attendance. Uh, uh, again, uh, business should also be supported, uh, that system to punish and to separate their emoluments from, uh, from their basic salary as a way to make them to work on a monthly basis. Parliament should schedule uh, again, should form. Uh, let me go to the main, let me leave other things here and say Parliament should increase funding for research department to generate data to help individual legislators to widen their knowledge 
improve their quality of uh, as analyzing bills. Maybe the, maybe the civil society need to work together with these MPs. Those civil society who are active in those areas should really begin to give talking points to these MPs as a way to improve the threshold of information that they in the debating. Then they also need to um, uh, adopt the system of speaker's list. Instead of everybody speaking for three minutes, I think the speaker should just select, maybe the party should select five, five, who can do research and give, be given 10 minutes each to start the debate. Then the rest can come with their three minutes, three minutes. So that pushes the quality of the debate upwards. And also because a lot of would have come from those who have done the research, they set the tone. The library and public relations department honestly needs to expand the, lead, the readership of the answer and non-classified parliamentary committee records to regional public libraries, offices, and so forth. There must be a way on social media and so forth. Government of Uganda should consider adopting the parliamentary scorecard, in my view, as a yardstick for measuring performance. But when you see them resisting, uh, <laughs> uh, I think they just need to adapt because we're just using citizens just need because the citizens are the employers, they are employees. So the, the citizens as employers must have a system of uh, appraising their performance to renew their contracts or not. Again, citizens also want uh, the to separate. Uh, the executive from the legislature. I think this time has come for members of parliament not to be appointed to serve as ministers. I think ministers should be technocratic outside those who are elected. MPs should just come and do what they have been elected yes. so that they are not bribed to become ministers and behave because you are waiting to be appointed minister. If you don't, you are not found. Okay, then they, I think we also need to, uh, to create maybe instead of increasing the size of parliament maybe we need to create two houses regional of parliament, parliament. Uh, two houses of parliament also to say that there are upper house and the lower house where the upper house the senate can scrutinize the decisions that have been taken by the lower house and that may increase the quality of decision making or improve the quality of decision making our legislative arm uh, makes if you decide, instead of increasing constituencies why don't you split and have the upper house the lower house uh, and so like in the case of Kenya. When you come to currently women composition, for me 33% in the leadership of parliament is so low. I think we need to aspire more, 40, even work towards 50%. And then citizens further wants MPs to have periodic feedback through regular, structured, predictable, quarterly constituency meetings. Every quarter, an MP must come, must be structured, feedback, where they come and tell people what has transpired in the last three months and where they pick issues to take back to parliament. And that, that quarterly meeting, constituency meeting must be documented and attendance must be and uh, live on radios and so forth. So there must be, a, not through funerals, not through burials, not through church meetings, not through informal, uh, there should be formalized ways of structuring citizens' feedback with their MPs. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this brings us to a close. It's been a very interesting debate. I think um, we, we, we didn't actually even finish it. I think we shall have to come back here and uh, <laughs> then look at look at in detail how the role of the speaker has changed over time and how is it also affecting the way parliament is run as an institution. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, in the studio, it has been David Paul Paul, um, the founding member of African Leadership Institute. And I also had uh, uh, Lydia Namayengo, who is also a political analyst. Uh, we've been discussing the 100 years of parliament's performance, closely looking at the, its progression or regression. Um, we will be here again uh, next Friday. Other than that, I wish you all a very uh, happy Resurrection Sunday, and uh, God bless. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay.